Well, hello, everybody. Um, wow, we're already on the last lecture of holiness. I'm certainly hoping and praying that you've gotten um, a lot out of this, not just some out of this. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. And um, you devote your life to understanding holiness. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to talk about in this last lecture. Uh, one of the things I want to get to is... Um, it was the only alternative word for holiness um, that is used twice in the New Testament. Uh, I believe that's it's either the sec second to the last section or it's the last section. And, um, you know, it's also related to uh, a Hebrew word, chassid, uh, and chassid, like the Hasidics, they're the devoted ones. And, um, <laughs> this particular word, Greek word, hosiotes. Uh, you'll notice that I that I refer to it in Luke chapter one, verse seventy four, and also in um, in uh, Ephesians chapter four, verse twenty four. Two very very important verses of scripture, by the way. And um, of course, in Luke chapter one, uh, verse seventy four uh, through seventy five. Zechariah is crying out saying, you know, look, from now on, we're going to get to live our lives in hosiotis and righteousness or holiness and righteousness or as hustids, devoted ones. But the reality of it is it's, it's really referring more to the divine law um, than anything else. And um, so I want to help you understand the, the divine law as being holiness and of course, then also in Ephesians chapter four and verse twenty-four, where you know Paul rejoices in that we put on the new man, which uh, which after God is created in righteousness and true hosiotis or holiness or chassid. And um, so, I, I want to spend a little time focusing on that. Hopefully, towards the end, and then also. Uh, basically embed everything that I'm going to say here in this last lecture around holiness being the divine law. Okay, so <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to turn your attention to Isaiah chapter 11 because there in Isaiah chapter 11 we discover um, really a description of, of the fullness of the Holy Ghost, the fullness of the Spirit. And I think that this kind of sets the tone for really understanding what the fear of the Lord is and how to mature and develop in the fear of the Lord and, and really to understand the insights of God. And so we look at verse 2 and we see that uh, this is a description of the sevenfold anointing that was on Christ Jesus or the fullness of the Holy Ghost, which if we are going to say that we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which we should say, um, especially in light of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, um, and then I, I would also say that, you know, this should not necessarily receiving the fullness of the spirit be just limited to an expression of, of baptism in the Holy Ghost, which is a demonstration primarily of power. Um, but that it is something that we receive when we receive the new birth and we're born of the spirit um, because as the John said of all of his fullness have all we received and I can't overemphasize that when we're referring to his fullness we're referring to his holiness that's who he is that's the essence of who he is and so what is the description of holiness and uh, here we have you know, the spirit of the Lord. And these are, this is very important for you to know because this should be extremely valuable to you. Um, recognizing, number one, that this was given to us so that we may grow and mature and develop in it. And we're not, we're not going to grow and mature and develop in anything that we haven't set our hearts on. Um, we're going to develop skills because we understand, you know, uh, the value of it, the importance of it, and so thus we're going to be diligent with it. We're going to be dedicated to, to these things. And so we see that there's seven dimensions to the fullness of the Spirit that was on Christ Jesus, and which is the Spirit that we have received at the new birth. 
And it's the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge uh, and of the fear of the Lord. So there's seven dimensions to the spirit of the Lord there, including the spirit of the Lord. So um, what, what, I what I want to emphasize here is that if you take just the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, and you begin to look, look at, for example, in Proverbs, also Job, also Psalms, just to start with, that you're going to discover that with wisdom and with understanding and with might, you are going to understand how to depart from evil, how to lay hold on the ways of God, to value and appreciate the ways of God, uh, to be, a, be able to have the insights of of his majesty of who he is that's going to give you a strength and give you a a, a motivation um, to turn away from everything that is in the world the more you fellowship with the world understand this the more people fellowship with the world that their hearts are turned away from the Lord uh, it's not God's turning away from us it the world turns our hearts away from the Lord and it just as the Lord described it to Israel when they were to go into their inheritance and what their proper response would be to the nations around them and to, you know, foreign women, foreign associations, foreign relationships. It would turn their heart from the Lord. And the, that's the last thing that we want. We want our hearts turned towards the Lord, consumed by the Lord and by his interest. And because ultimately, when we start walking in these things, then they are going to begin to pour out of us. It's like, you know, when when um, when Paul was ministering to Felix, uh, he was ministering under such an authority of the Holy Spirit, who's come to convict and convince the world of sin, to reprove the world of sin, to shine a light on sin and show us show how terrible what it is. That as he began to talk to Felix about a righteousness and about self-control and about judgment, uh, Felix was shaking in his boots. And so um, the awesome fear of the Lord, which is the last one that's listed there in the sevenfold anointing, um, is something that we want to grab a hold of. It's associated with wisdom, associated with understanding, it's associated with knowledge. Um, but, of course, there's a whole lot more to wisdom to say about wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. I'm just not going to go into that, although I, I would like to and, and show some of the connectivity between having the fullness of the Spirit and have, having the fullness of the outworking of the Holy Spirit, which is basically encapsulated and described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 11. Um, but one of the things I really want to grab a hold of is to recognize that the fear of the Lord is, is going to cause us to depart from evil. And, you know, look, the reality of it is everything that belongs to the, to the ways of sin and iniquity, as I said previously, God's at war against it. Excuse me while I take a sip of the tea. And um, a holiness is going to be at war against all iniquity and sin because it's such a violation against life. Holiness is absolutely a state of life and, and that which is right and that which is good. I mean, it's like this. Everything that you value the most in life is something that has to do, that's more important than everything else is something that has to do with love. And it's love in a relationship like a husband or a wife or children. They are above all other things, above all other values in life. And that then is actually a just dim reflection of the love of God that he has poured into us by the Holy Spirit that he wants expressed in our life. That, we're gonna, that we are going to have to be willing to develop and grow and mature in that dimension of holiness. It's not that Father hasn't given it to us. Um, as I said before, we don't have to struggle with, oh, I want to be holy, oh, I want to be righteous. It's a gift. He, give, he gave it to us. He made it very, very simple. He made it very easy. He worked a miracle for us simply because we were willing to, to allow him to work a miracle. And, and, and as I was referring to before, I, there, there's many, in many respects, the gospel has been represented because Jesus has been represented as 
you know, someone that's going to come along and be just a part of the, the life that you've been living in the world. And it's not so. He's the means by which now we are delivered, rescued from the world. And and it's really utilizing those word, words and, and the full meaning of them, delivered, rescued. I mean, where you're basically being tormented and tortured in a prison. And you come to recognize it and you want out. Well, the Holy Ghost has come to bring that kind of insight. Uh, to all the world through the convicting power and work of the Holy Spirit that has had a work and place in our life. And now there's an outworking of that. And and then, so then we, we want to understand, well, then how do I grow in this? And how do I mature in this? If I receive the fullness of God, then I've got to understand in the proper respect how I have received the fullness of God, how I have received this holiness, how I have received... Uh, his righteousness and these this disposition of God is by nature at war against all sin and iniquity because it's not only opposites it's ex this extreme violation against everything that God is and everything that God has created it's that which would destroy all life that's what would that that which pollutes all things you know there's one thing that no one needs to be convinced of and that is that the world needs to be redeemed are you kidding me I mean, the whole world lies in wickedness. No one should need to be convinced of that. The whole world lies in wickedness. And, um, oh, excuse me while I sip on my tea. It's it's morning time for me, and um, it, it helps. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and, 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 and the whole world lying in wickedness, everybody's got their whole spectrum of what they think is acceptable it's okay and then what's really terrible and in reality all sin and iniquity all sin and iniquity is terrible it's all a violation against life and what father wants to do is he wants to bring us out of that bring us over into a place where now he can be he begin to teach us the ways of life just imagine i mean if you're preoccupied with the ways of death how are you ever going to learn about the ways of life <laughs> you're not. You're going to actually be going in the opposite direction. The Lord, so therefore, the Lord redeems us. He He's uh, saved us, having delivered us out of this present evil world. That's a powerful statement, Paul, which I lay hold on, and you should lay hold on as well, so that we can sit at His feet and be taught, and now desire the sincere nourishment of God's Word and ministry of the Holy Spirit, so that we can grow and mature in these things. And you can't keep making wrong choices to participate with things that are vile and holy, that are going to turn your heart away from God, that are going to distract you from the things of the Lord and expect that somehow you're going to grow and mature and develop in all that Father has given us when you're handling the detestable things, when your meditation is upon things that just that are just, you know, you know, outright wicked. Um so, you know, there's a lot of things that I, I really want to, to say here, but, you know, the most important thing is you can't be quenching communion with God, um, you know, and, and giving yourself over to anything that is, belongs to the unfruitful works of darkness and expect that you're now in this, the class of the Holy Spirit or in the school of the Holy Ghost where you're really learning the value of God's wisdom, of God's knowledge, of God's understanding, of God's counsel, of God's might. I mean, when we talk about God's might, my goodness, it's his kratos power. And, um, you know, that's his creative power. He wants to He wants to reveal to us all these amazing things that belong to who he is. But there is absolutely no way when we're all, in, if we're going to involve ourselves with everything that, is, that belongs to the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, that belongs to all that God is opposed to, that God is at war with, and, and you know, that his judgments are upon. You know, if we just spend a, a bit of time thinking about the spirit of holiness and, and, you know, why the spirit of holiness has been given to us and what the spirit of holiness actually does in terms of the work of the Holy Ghost, it, it, these things are certain to turn our attention away from compromises that we would allow and and begin to have a greater devotion to the insight and revelation 
that God the Holy Ghost brings when he brings conviction. What is he doing? He's bringing to us a revelation and an insight to the ways of God, how Father feels about things. And yes, it should cause us to fear and tremble. So let me walk you through um, some of the verses of Scripture regarding the fear of the Lord. Because at, you know, at the heart of the fear of the Lord, we're going to understand some things about our proper response to the world, to the world around us, our responsible uh, response to every demonic influence, and then to recognize it's not something that you know we look to ourselves to develop in. It's rather a divine insight that has been given to us. It is a function and activity of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Holiness. It's called the fear of the Lord, and I think one of the biggest places that, uh, or impacts of that message of the fear of the Lord and what the fear of the Lord brings is there in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 20. And this is why Father revealed himself. It's why he made himself known to all of Israel. It's why he audibly spoke to them uh, from the mountain so that he could set his fear before them, his awe before them. And it's really, Yara, Hebrew word, is fear. It's not just awe, it's fear. And it's to recognize God's judgment, that he's at war against sin, He's a, and rightfully so. He is devoted to life. He is the life giver. He's not going to allow death. And death has crept in, and death is ultimately going to completely be done away with. And right now, it's important for us to grab a hold of the fear of the Lord and understand how to mature in it, how to develop in it, because, you know, we may start off not hating evil. And, and, and of course, this is where all men are, but actually loving evil. And that is a terrible thing to even think about. And of course, you know, loving the evil that the person uh, or the individual has allowed um, in, in their life. And of course, once again, I'm saying that because, you know, there be pe there's many people who, haven't been born again, they're lost, they're bound by the powers of darkness and this and the law of sin and death, but you, they're not murderers, okay? And they're not, you know, um, vile, wicked people, but yet there is still sin and iniquity going on in their life in, in various different dimensions. And, and the fear of the Lord is going to teach us to hate all those things that would cause us to have any kind of, of discord or separation between us and the Lord. And that grows and that matures as we give ourselves over to this fellowship with God and hearing his voice. And, and now we get to hear his voice even in a louder way because he's come to live on the inside of us. That's the glory of the new birth. I mean, that's the highlight of the new birth, that the spirit of holiness has come to inhabit us. He's not only outside, he's on the inside. And um, that we have this opportunity to fellowship and commune with him in an unlimited and uninhibited way. And so, you know, we read verses of scripture like you find in Job 28, 28. He says, unto man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil in, in every evil way, well, that is understanding. And um, wow, that's, you know, so it kind of helps us to understand that when we receive the fullness of the Spirit, we get to grow as Jesus did in wisdom. We get to grow in, as Jesus did in knowledge. We get to grow as Jesus did in wisdom. And that these are undergirding this fear of the Lord, this awesome revelation of who God is as judge and, and the reality of what he's devoted to and what he is absolutely not going to allow and he, and, and he can't allow. And if he did allow it, everything about who he is would be completely done away with life would be done away with and that's how devoted we need to be to these things um the psalmist says the fear of the lord is clean enduring forever wow and right with the fear of the lord is not only you know an understanding of of, of who god is the insights of his of his presence but a, 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 an ability to see every one of our words and deeds tried before him at the time, to always see him before us and on our right hand that we should not be moved. I mean, you talk about dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, on the El Elyon, the Most High, and, and having him, you know, having him then being so close to us that we're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. What a defense, you know. And with that fear of the Lord is the judgments of the Lord. Psalms 19.9. 9. 
they're true and they're righteous altogether. Everything that he decides, it's, it is absolutely, you're right. You're right, Lord. You're absolutely right. And um, there's, it's never going to be a, an ability to stand before his presence and say, wait a minute, you got it wrong. Uh, because he, he's never going to get it wrong. And, um, and then, of course, you know, it's, it's something that, that also you find in Psalms 3411 that's repeated by Peter in First Peter. It says, come now, children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Listen to the listen to the instruction of the fear of the Lord. What man is, what who among you desires life, and would love to see many good days, will depart from evil then, because it will absolutely prevent that wonderful consequence of our life to to live out the, our lives in 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 the goodness of the Lord, and not just you know, a temporal period of time, but for eternity, everything about our life should be really a preparation to make a transition from this life into the life to come. This is a, this is a point of decision. As I've heard it say, said many times, you know, this is a, as a dress rehearsal, it's, it's saying, well, are we ready to go into life? What is it that we want? And father's ch saying, choose life and live, you know, choose Choose the right way and live. There's a way of life. There's a law of the spirit of life. And that is ultimately going to result in eternal life. And there's a law of sin and death. And that results in everything that is, you know, destructive and everything that belongs to an eternal death. And, and the choice is ours. And praise God, he's manifested his righteousness not to leave us in a place where we don't we are without revelation, we're without insight, we're without a choice. He's given every man a choice. There's not a single person on the face of the earth right now that is not given a choice by God. Will you choose life and live? Will you choose my way and live? And um, because it's not my way or the highway, it's it's the only way. <laughs> so Psalms 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. And um, God has given us that wisdom and he's given us that understanding and he's given us that knowledge so that we may grow and mature in it. And the more that we grow and mature in it, the more the resolve, the more the commitment, the more we find ourselves absolutely chassid, devoted to the divine law and, and walking in those things which the Lord has chosen. The more we have insight, wow, Lord, you have, everything you said is right. Everything that you've declared is absolutely truth. I'm so glad I listened to you because look at the results of it. I get to live out this life of abundance and freedom and, and, and so much more. Um, this days of heaven upon earth and the days of heaven in heaven itself that's soon to come. You know, Proverbs 2, 5, uh, he says, Then shall you understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. When? When will you understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God? Uh, when you've received the insights, when you've made the decisions to part from iniquity, to recognize where iniquity will lead you, what the end results are of iniquity are, are going to be and you know goodness gracious the, the way the father has empowered us to have this understanding where we're not just having to try to process it from an intellectual point of view but this is the spirit of the lord a dimension of the fullness of the spirit that now resides on the inside of us, causing us to shake and to quake in the awesome awareness of the reality of who God is and, and what he's like and, and his judgments. Pro just, just a couple more verses of scripture real quickly. Like Proverbs eight thirteen, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and every evil way. So this is what the Holy Ghost is teaching us. And if we will learn these things, then the communication of the Holy Spirit in our life will have a greater impact on those choices that we make and a greater impact on the people around us that listen to us and interact with us. And on and on, Proverbs 19, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Thank you, Father, for giving us all these wonderful things. 
out of your own ability, out of your own power, which is just, once again, the expressions of his holiness, divine insight, insight to have knowledge and understanding about what's really going on around here instead of constantly being deceived and, and chasing one, you know, uh, falsehood and, and deception after another only to be in only to end up in a prison uh, of and a, a consequence of the wages of sin that is death or to be plagued by the demonic power so really more than anything else is I, I really want you to grab a hold of the fear of the Lord and what the fear of the Lord does the fear of the Lord teaches us to depart from evil to hate iniquity to abhor it to abhor arrogance and pride and the as King James says, the fraud way, the arrogant way, and um, but the bottom line of it is once again, it's growing and maturing these things, and the more that you allow the work of the Holy Ghost to work within your life, the more we allow the Holy Ghost to work within our life, then we're going to be under a greater, as it were, conviction of the Holy Spirit or reproof against the world or a rebuke against the unfruitful works of darkness. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's wonderful what God the Holy Ghost comes to help us to, to do and, and, and to be able to see and have proper motivation towards. I mean, Paul said that the law was given to make sin exceedingly sinful. Well, that's good, and that's true, obviously, because it's the word of God, but if the law can make sin exceedingly sinful, how much more does communion with the Holy Spirit make sin exceedingly sinful? And really the point of it is, it's just, you know, interacting with God's love, interacting with God's life, interacting with him and spending more time in heaven, <laughs> you know, in a heavenly realm. You, you and I get to enter into a heavenly realm just simply because we obey the word of God. That simple. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11. I love to refer to it because it's a great contrast. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, the Lord says, really, by and large, just obey me. Keep my commandments. Just do what I'm telling you. If you just do what I'm telling you, the consequence of that is that you're going to have days of heaven upon the earth. Who, who would want anything other than the days of heaven upon the earth to live in heaven now? Why is it that men want to be convinced that somehow that there is still some form of iniquity that has a hold of them that demands that they sin less or more or less every day. I mean, come on, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's like no one has a theology that Enoch was born again, but look, I mean, but he lived a, obviously a life that it seems to be far better than many people who say that they're born again are living. Uh, we have no theology that would teach us that Abraham was born again, but he certainly was laying a hold on something of, of that power as he looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. Because once again, <laughs> you know, in many respects, he lived in a way that it is, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's sad to say it, but he lived in a way that is more a description uh, the fruits of being born again than many believers today. And I could say the same thing of Moses and of Joshua. I could say the same thing of so many others. We go all the way to Daniel. And uh, this just shouldn't be. And so what, what really is the problem? The problem is a mixture in our life. A problem is that we haven't really set the proper boundaries. The problem really is, is that we're not listening to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Ghost is not forceful. He's not going to you know, make us do anything. But the more we yield to him, the more we will submit our will to him, the louder his voice becomes in our life. The more we hang out with life, the less we want death, the more that we enjoy the, you know, the, the beauty of his love, the beauty of his joy, the beauty of living in his goodness. I'm telling you, there is absolutely nothing in this world to compare. And what happens is if we then involve ourselves in the things that belong to this world, we find ourselves being jerked right out of the paradise of relationship. And it's not because God is so much departed, our heart is departed at, from the Lord, and he's still there with his love and his mercy reaching out to us, calling out to us, 
but are we ever going to really respond? Because the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to bring us to repentance. And that should be the primary response that we would have to the ministry of the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. I mean, once again, Felix trembled. Uh, uh, Zacchaeus said, if I have taken anything wrongfully, I restore fourfold. I mean, you know, there is this, there is this work of grace that goes on our life that causes us to recognize, wait a minute, I've been doing wrong. I've been living wrong. This is unjust. And I don't want to live this way anymore. And, you know, in addition to that, think about the motivation that every one of us should have waking up every morning just full of joy, full of peace. And we don't need anything to have joy and to have peace. We have this fellowship with the Holy Ghost and we don't need to be necessarily a church meeting, although they are good, to be walking around filled with the Spirit, filled with the life of God, singing and making melody in our heart. I mean, it's just time for the manifested sons of God to suddenly be revealed on the earth today. And, and you know, we've received the authority to be sons. Um, and we have uh, received the, this divine ability to function in everything that belongs to the ministry of Christ Jesus. People talk about, well, you know, you got to wait to get to heaven. No, Jesus did it in an earthly, physical body, corruptible body that was absolutely no different from the one that you and I have received. And if that isn't enough to stop the infiltration of Gnostic doctrines within the framework of the doctrines of the church today, I don't know what is to recognize that we can present our bodies holy and acceptable unto God, that we're to glorify God in our bodies as well as our spirits because they belong to his, him, that our bodies are the temple of the living God, that our bodies aren't ruling our spirit, our spirit is ruling our body, and, and though our body is still, the creation is still in bondage to corruption, yet we have been delivered out of the corruption because we have been raised up together with him spiritually, inwardly, and that's going to ultimately result in our bodies that are corruptible being also raised up to have a body just eternal, immortal, incorruptible body just like the one that he has. And so, you know, there really, there are no excuses. It's just, it, there's just, unfortunately, there is this lack of revelation about who God is. There's this lack of interaction uh, with him that causes us to more perfectly understand that Father chose the best you know, it wasn't like somehow, you know, he, you know, chose some kind of a boring kind of lifestyle or whatever. He chose life. And uh, who, who would have choose life over death? Everyone. You'll struggle to have hold on to life from a natural point of view. There is absolutely nothing that you would not do to retain uh, your life, you know, in a, in, in a, sane dimension and proper response to life. And so it should also be with us concerning the spiritual life that we've been giving and the, uh, given and this wonderful, glorious communion and fellowship that we now have in him, you know, this privilege to be hid away. You know, he that dwells in the secret place uh, of the Almighty shall do, uh, he that dwells in the secret place of the Lord shall do, uh, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty to recognize the secret places, this privilege that you and I right now have to live in him and dwell in him and that he lives in us and dwells in us. That This is the whole basis of the communion. This is the whole basis of the fellowship. This is the whole you know, privilege that we have to live out this wonderful divine life and function under the divine law of holiness, which is the, which is the presence of the Lord. It's living in, that's the divine law, living in the presence of the Lord, being consecrated to the Lord, being separated unto him, being wholly devoted to who he is. It's so unfortunate that, you know, God is who he is and men don't like him. It's so unfortunate that he's the loving, meek, lowly, amazing, giving, generous God that he is and men don't like him and you know and and that's been proven over and over again from Sinai all the way till today God in his love comes to 
you know, reveal himself, speak audibly his word so that he may establish his fear in our lives so that we would not sin, so we would not depart into the ways of darkness and begin to fellowship with things and desire things and want things and allow the activity of things that are actually his enemies that he's at war against, that he's opposed to. Because if there's any way to describe God, he's the keeper of life. He's the sustainer of life. He's the author of life. And praise God that he's also the author and finisher of our faith. If we're just simply willing to come and 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 receive from him and interact with him and uh, and then consequentially simply be devoted to him I, I just i believe with all of my heart that moses response to god is the proper response of every person who's ever encountered god and that is that you want more this is amazing and it is amazing to have this in kind of encounter i think that you know, there's a possibility that we've been willing to reduce that encounter um, for for some ulterior reasons, for some ulterior motivations, maybe consciously or unconsciously. But we need to recognize, wait a minute, there is an encounter that we may have with God that he's made available to anybody who desires. And we you know, have to deal with the reality that there are demonic forces and powers of darkness that are keeping men from that encounter. And there are supposed to be ministers walking around with enough divine power and authority in Christ Jesus to do exactly what Christ Jesus uh, is doing and would do and to do exactly what the Holy Ghost is doing. And um, that is to break off those powers of darkness, to remove the demonic out of the way. I mean, you think about this, how those de demon spirits that possessed the man of Gadara were really keeping that man from encountering the light that is in Christ Jesus. And if Christ Jesus had not had the authority of God to break that yoke, to drive out those devils, that man would have never known what it means to interact with God, to have a relationship with God, to have the joy, to have the peace. I promise you, he never went back to his demons. And I, I, I have a sense that we have really failed in that area because we've really failed in our fellowship and communion with the Lord and our consecration of being wholly devoted to the action and activity of the Holy Spirit to mature in these things that belong to the fullness of the Spirit so that we can also then mature in the outworking or the demonstration of that fullness which we see in the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, working of miracles, gifts of healing, uh, gift of faith, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, you know, all of this wonderful exploits, divine exploits of power and authority that is made available to us to where that we can cast out devils, that all unclean spirits are subject to us. And that that is the ministry and a very vital and important ministry of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And why, if we are going to truly be ministers of the gospels, gospel and witnesses of his resurrection, then we're going to have to be endued with power and authority to deal with these mind-blinding spirits, these demonic strongholds that keep men from the most important thing, and that is the encounter with God to begin to live out this wonderful life that he's made for us through interaction with them, through communion with them, through relationship with them, rather than trying to do it, you know, ideologically or philosophically out of our own strength and out of our own ability because once you be start beginning to behold the majesty of his glory you can't do anything other than begin to scream out this is wonderful holy 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 is the lord the whole earth is filled with his, his glory wouldn't it be wonderful for you to start living out a life to where that you look around and you go wow this whole earth is filled with his glory instead of having to be drawn in to a world that lies in such evil and wickedness, saying they're having a good time. But my, you can see that there is a serious need for redemption. People living in the vileness of, of immorality and then the, the torment that, and, and the unrest and the misery and the suffering 
that all of that brings. I mean, Father's come to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly, and we need to know that that's the holy life. That's the life of holiness. That I'm, you know, is sad that it has been misrepresented, has been misunderstood. But I pray that you understand it more than everything, more than anything else. I pray that you understand that the divine law has been placed within us, written upon our hearts written upon our minds, that he's written his laws in our in our hearts and our minds, his ways in our hearts and our, in our minds. And now he's given us the Holy Spirit so that we'll be able to understand it more fully and develop and grow in it. And what a helper. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's just amazing what all God has done for us. And somehow we've undervalued it and we confined it to religious expressions and religious ideas. But I pray in the name of Jesus that you become more consecrated to the things of God than you have ever been in your life. That you be more consecrated to the ways of God than you've ever been in your life. That you have, you know, more consecrated to the interaction with the Holy Spirit, to dwelling in the secret place, to recognizing the empowerment of, that God has given you and the beauty of holiness. And the beauty, which is the beauty of life, which is the beauty of enjoying life to, to its fullness. That you won't allow yourself to just go around sorrowful and sad and happy and disappointed and discouraged. You just stop and you just begin to allow the Holy Ghost to overwhelm you, to fill you, to flow out of you, this wellspring of life, to take hold of you. God has given us the ability. He's given us the power. Why should we in any way neglect such a, a wonderful and unspeakable gift? as that which we have received from him. So you decide the day you're going to live in holiness, which is to live in love. And you decide today you're going to live in joy. You're going to be consecrated. You're going to be devoted to the divine law because we've been delivered out of the hand of our enemies. And now we get to serve him in righteousness and holiness all the days of our life. Wow. Love all of you guys. Bless you.